lots and lots of uh, videos online on YouTube. Uh, for example, there's a series that I did on the history of philosophy in Urdu, which actually also ran on Pakistan television, which is the main TV channel of Pakistan. Then I came up with my second album, which was called Putro Meri Dunya, which was also released in India. And uh, at this time, in about 2012, there was a, an insurgency, a civil war going on in the northern areas of Pakistan, with religious fundamentalists trying to take over the state. So at this, from 2012 onwards, I began a campaign against religious fundamentalism and extremism, which was called Music for Peace. And I did over 300 concerts in rural areas in about four years. You can imagine that I was teaching and I was doing these concerts in rural areas. I was traveling and uh, I had two kids and uh, I was also uh, had uh, responsibilities on behalf of the party. I was uh, acting as the general secretary at that time as well. And so you can imagine this was a pretty hectic time in my life. Not that things have brought any less hectic since then. Uh, but because of this campaign, we were also able to then have uh, a over a million followers on Facebook and now uh, about 100,000 followers on YouTube. Uh, this is really, uh, if I were to you know, blow my own trumpet here, one of the longest uh, sustained music, political music campaign. Now, uh, I will give you the introduction, and I do that not because I want to, as I said, blow my own trumpet and my own achievements or something, but only to give you a background that this is something we have practiced and we have seen the results of it, the results have been phenomenal and we, I, I share this with you, to share the experience with you, to tell you how you can take your, the work of your party, mainstream it, mainstream the message uh, through art and through culture uh, and through literature. You know he was very eloquent, and, uh, but you may not know that before he became an economist and a philosopher, his interest was to be a playwright and to be a poet. So Marx initially, I mean, he did his PhD on uh, Greek philosophy, Greek philosophy on the Democritus and Epicurean view of the world, etc. But he was very much interested in being a poet and a playwright. I think several of his books, in fact, uh, are dedicated to who was at that time his uh, girlfriend and fiance, and later became his wife. Jenny Marks. Now why do I have to raise this question? For some people, I think this will not necessarily be uh, something of an enigma if you are already familiar with uh, uh, progressive art and its accomplishments, then some of this may be very uh, familiar to you. But to others, it may be very new, given the fact that in this generation, part in the last 20 years or so, popular art in particular has come to be completely dominated by what we can call commercial art. And commercial art seems to, at the surface of it, have no purpose behind it. It has no purpose behind it, save just the purpose of being popular and then hence being lost. So it follows a very capitalist logic. The logic of commercial art is that its purpose is to be as popular as possible and to generate as much money as possible. And whatever you can do to achieve that objective is fine. So whether you are uh, uh, using your sexuality to achieve that purpose or you are using some political messaging even to achieve the same purpose, uh, you could be talking about race or gender or something else. As long as it is popular, as long as it generates money, that's what, that is the sole criteria that is applied to art nowadays. Given that, given how that has now come to dominate over art, and given also how the other idea that has come to dominate over art is that art is and must be always and everywhere only and only an expression of individuality. Now, of course, art will always be an expression of some level of individuality because it is individuals who come together to create art. And sometimes it is individuals alone who create art. Like a painter is not doing anything collective. A band may be doing something collective. But even a band is, is, is 
composed of individuals. And their individuality will definitely show in their art. So on the one hand, this is a truism that art will be the expression of your individuality. But what is being obscured in all of this, and in fact undermined in all of this, is the idea that art ought to have a purpose. In the ancient world amongst the Greeks, this was almost taken as a given. It was, given, it was a, taken as a granted. In fact, art was rarely ever done for commercial purposes. Art was not commercially viable. Most of the art was in fact done for patrons. That it, it, that could be the Catholic Church, it could be the uh, uh, an important family, it could be a royal family, or whatnot. But the purpose of the art was to win a patron, not to sell in large quantities. The commercialization of art, the sale of art in large quantities, of course, required a technological revolution. It required the creation of first LPs about music, data cassettes, CDs, and now just the sale of art or music online through various digital platforms. In much the same way painting, one could have a painting in every room, one could have a Rembrandt in every room simply by uh, reproducing the original and making hundreds of prints of the original. So you could enjoy that art in your room. It would be the original but you would still have a replica of it in millions. So therefore, the change in technology now, with capitalism, with print technology, with the way in which music was uh, shared, made it possible to make art commercial. Let's take, for example, music. There was a time when, when a microphone and uh, a sound system simply did not exist. And since microphones and sound systems did not exist, Artists had to sing uh, without amplification and play without it. And to get a large number of people to be able to hear you, you had to create halls that were acoustically created in such a way that they would reject the voice of the singer. Singers had to have big voices. That's why singers also had to be big, because big people had big voices. Not always, but <laughs> Um, and uh, so, but even then, the human voice can only get to a certain level. Uh, maybe you can have, maybe if you have a really big voice, you could have a couple of hundred people listen to it without amplification. You could, but you couldn't have a thousand people or two thousand or ten thousand people listen to music if it was uh, purely uh, the human voice being projected. So that's why in Europe then, for bigger concerts, the voice was even left out. You had brass instruments, percussion instruments, that could be much louder than the human voice. And they could then be, uh, be uh, you know, the, that sound will then be projected to maybe about a thousand people. So that's how you get the big band concert, not just the American big band, but the musicians that would play classical music would be much louder than the human voice, but they could only play up to maybe a thousand. With the development of amplification, you could now have concerts with a hundred thousand attending something. And that meant that the ticket prices could come down and you could sell, you know, a hundred thousand tickets. Uh, you could sell five hundred thousand tickets. We even had concerts with over a million people attending on beaches and open areas, etc. And you could sell those tickets and now you could make concerts uh, commercially viable in a way in which they were not commercially viable before. To tell you something interesting, one of the first concerts that the Beatles did, they were basically playing on stage and then they had various radio systems set up. So they amplified the sound through radios that were set up in the audience. But of course they got more sophisticated as time went on and today you don't need to put radios. But what I'm trying to say is that the development of technology made it possible for art to be shared with the public on a much larger scale than was possible either in ancient society or in the medieval world. That doesn't mean that states and poor people and working class people and peasants didn't have their art. They did. That was called folk art. But what it meant was that that was art sadly 
if it was ever preserved, it was preserved not in the written form, not in libraries, but it was transmitted only through continuously playing. Where there is the, uh, the culture of the high art was written down, it was preserved, and it traveled through time. It was only much, much later when people began to realize the importance of folk art that they also began to write down, preserve in one form or another. Folk tales and folk so, what we think we know about the art of various civilizations and societies that have existed was mainly the high art of those societies. And sadly, much of the folk art that was produced was lost in the wilderness. So, while in the ancient world, the idea therefore was very common that with respect to high art, it was supposed to reach a high artistic level and it was also supposed to reflect the dominant philosophical idea of the ruling class at that time. Whether that was Plato or Aristotle or Islam or Christianity or what not, it had to reflect that. Because its purpose was not commercial, so there was never that kind of commercial pressure. So for that reason, it was always given that it would be purposive art. But now that you could make money from art, the whole purpose changed. And together with that, when you got the emergence of modern art, which by the way you might be interested to discover, was very much promoted by the CIA at one time against socialist, realist art. But when you got the emergence of modern art, you also got the idea that emerged with modern art, that art that was, that, that was done for the purpose was in a certain sense inauthentic. Art that was done with a purpose was somehow or the other inauthentic. And art that was purposeless, uh, that was without, was without purpose, it just was the expression of your individuality, even if it was quite absurd, and even if you didn't understand what it was, reflecting something much more deep. So, for instance, in fact, some of the earliest people who started this movement were the Italian futurists. The interesting thing about the Italian futurists was that they were associated with and they were they were very explicitly part of the fascist movement of Italy. So in fact, the origins of modern art are in the fascist philosophical movement of Italy. They were the first ones in fact to develop this. Although there are other origins as well, I'm not saying that the only origin. So futurism is the art movement that really led the way to what we consider to be modern art today. Futurism was associated with Italian fascism. So, interestingly though, in the post-World War II period, as Surrealism, Dadaism and other art forms that we, that together form part, form part of the umbrella of modern art, came to represent the values of liberal democracy against fascism on the one hand and communism on the other hand, both of which were in the liberal framework associated now with each other as totalitarianism and therefore equated with each other. Therefore, in art, the way in which the liberal bourgeoisie of the West wanted to differentiate itself from both the socialist as well as the fascist project and wanted to paint both of them as being totalitarian was by selecting for itself modern art on the one hand in terms of its form and commercial art in terms of its goal and what it was supposed to be. This destroyed the notion in our generation especially that art could serve or ought to serve any other purpose. But if we go back in time just a little bit, we discover in fact that the movement that allowed Europe to emerge from what we, what Europeans themselves referred to as the Dark Ages was not a philosophical movement, was not even a political movement to begin with, but was, a, was an art movement. And that of course is the Renaissance. And anybody who studies art history, European art history knows this. I'm sure the Europeans here uh, you know, know this better than I do, probably on the back of their 
tens, etc. So the rent is off from 13, 30 to 15, 50. An Italian art movement, and normally I put the entire image of David, but since I made this presentation for Pakistanis, and Pakistanis are quite queasy about uh, new nudity, so I can't have to be. So, uh, what was the Renaissance? It began in the 14th century, it is said to last till about the 17th century. It's considered the rebirth and a period of extraordinary cultural creativity. It's considered to be a bridge between the medieval and the modern periods, and it is considered to have laid the new foundation of modern Europe. It renewed an interest in the classical Greco Roman, in classical Greco Roman learning, in particular in the plays and in the, in the, in the literature of, uh, of Rome. And of course, the Renaissance art, this is uh, the Mona Lisa, I'm familiar with it. Renaissance art studied Greek and Roman works and revived the classical form of art. Uh, it revived the way in which the Greeks looked at art. In particular, it revived the ideas of perspective and 3D, I think for now, three dimensional. And the three great geniuses of this art are Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Raphael. The thing about that is, that when I look at the Mona Lisa today, I might not realize that these people are leading an intellectual, an artistic, an intellectual and also a political, philosophical revolution in their times. They are revolutionaries of their times. Because the entire art is geared towards the philosophical idea of humanism. The idea of humanism, of course, is that we are sick and tired of talking about what happens in the hereafter, in the life hereafter. And the entire focus of our efforts ought to be on this one. So humans, not God, is at the center of all our understanding. Even in the context of religion, if you think religion is about God, it's actually not about God. It's actually about us. It's about our projections. As pure love we're putting. It's about our projections. What we want society to be, that we are projecting onto the world, onto an almighty figure. But this was not yet necessarily secular art, but this idea was reflected in that art that we must focus on humanity explicitly. Florence and Venice abandoned medieval feudalism to create a plutocracy where commerce and science began to flourish, and this began to spread all over Europe. And uh, one of the great Renaissance philosophers was Niccolo Machiavelli, who of course changed the very way in which we look at political science. Instead of looking at what ought to be, he began to ask the important question, let's study what actually is, what really exists. And so his writing marks a definitive change uh, from the theological point of view to a scientific point of view to examine politics. So humanism was literature, but the Renaissance was the arts. It focused, as I said before, on worldly affairs, wanted to stimulate individual creativity, and it changed the entire syllabus changed the entire way in which education was managed in Europe. So the old scholastic tradition that was part of the Roman, uh, Roman Catholic Church was now transformed to the based on theology, was now transformed uh, to the, human, the approach that is called humanities, uh, which was a focus on grammar, on rhetoric, on poetry, on history, and on music. Also on music, music was very simple. And of course it had the, the lasting influence that it gave rise to what we today call the liberal arts. Petrarch was one of the early humanist poets. He assembled the library of the Greco-Roman works and popularized Cicero, Homer, Virgil and so on. I hate Cicero by the way. Marx and Engels also hated him uh, because they really reactionary. But nonetheless he played a very important role in, 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 in the humanist period. And he is the one who refers to uh, the Christian period as the dark ages of Europe. Then we have Erasmus in praise of folly, who is a Dutch priest, considered the crowning glory of Christian humanists, translated the Bible into the vernacular, and he wrote, happiness is reached when a person is ready to be what he really is. A message that you see repeated in every Hollywood movie that you can So, you know, they're all busy. Machiavelli, one of my favorite writers, even though much they write it and hate it, I love this guy. Because <laughs> he's a genius. He's, 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 he's incredible. Um, was, of course, an Italian historian, politician, diplomat, philosopher, humanist, writer, who is in Florence, etc. You know, you can always appreciate these figures in the 
history, if you contextualize, you have to contextualize every figure in history. If I look, if I read Machiavelli and I try to, you know, context, and I try to see what he's saying about the 21st century, he's totally out of date. He's useless. He's, he's sexist. He's a horribly sexist person. He's got some horrible ideas. But if I put him in the 15th, in the 16th, and 15th century, that's when I begin to appreciate what he really says. It's the same with all the great historical figures: uh, Jesus Christ, Muhammad. Uh, Moses, etc. You have to put that in their proper historical context. There will come a time when Karl Marx will be completely antiquated now today, and people will say, Oh my God, this guy, what was he even on about? I read this passage and I read that passage, and it was really out of date. And really, there are still passages in Marx in the 21st century that you can read and you'll feel, Marx you should, you should have written it this way, you should have written it. I get your point, but the way you've written it is just not really nice. You know? So you could have put it another way. And so already we can see that parts of his book, parts of the stylistic way in which he puts things are today out of date. But nonetheless, we have to contextualize it in the 19th century and take for me what is person. So he emancipated finally the study of politics and theology. And then came the print revolution, uh, where the of course the uh, from uh, Gutenberg. Uh, the movable type was created, and this created, uh, you know, uh, books in, in huge number. Uh, first, it was mainly the Bible that was published in huge number, but in the vernacular, that is in local languages, in German and in, you know French and so on. And then, then later on, because the press was now in the control of Protestant rebels, they began to publish everything that would sell. They began to publish everything and anything they would publish, whatever would sell. And a lot of stuff that was selling was against the Roman Catholic Church. And so this rapid dissemination of ideas changed the way in which the European mind was thinking about it. My point, what's my point? Why did I say all this? I think this is pretty basic stuff as far as European history is concerned. But why did I say all this? I said all of this because I want to underscore the central role that music, art and literature play in the transformation of Europe from its medieval period to its modern. A similar role will be played and is being played and must be played by art, literature, poetry in the transformation of the world from capitalism to socialism. As Marx said, the quotation I read out to you, it is the immortal essence of the times. So what is what is the central concern of humanity? in that particular point in time, at that particular point in time, cannot but be, but be expressed through art, which is of course the expression of the questions that concern us collectively, individually as well as well. Take for example now, some, some examples from non-European history, the Hindu sutras. Uh, yesterday when I was singing, uh, you may or may not have noticed that most of my songs are based on the ragas of Hindu uh, uh, that, that we get from ancient Hinduism. They're all based on the ragas. Rag Eman, for example, is not necessarily Hindu, is really Rag Yaman. And Yaman is a country. And the reason why they call it Rag Eman is because the Hindus discovered that the Yemenese lay. There's a lot of people who call it Rag Eman. They come on. The Bhairvi Rag, the Sindhi Bhairvi Rag, was mainly played in Sindh. And you might be interested to discover that the Sindhi Bhairvira is identical to the harmonic minor scale, which of course is played all over the Iberian Peninsula in Spain. And here's the interesting thing, I went to I went to Iran just a month ago and I was listening to the radio. And every Iranian song had the same six chords and progression. And that was the harmonic minor progression. You know, A minor and E major and you know, G and then F and then E minor and then back to A minor. I mean, song up and song up and song up and song up at the same progression. The people I was traveling with were not musicians, so they weren't able to make it out, but I was able to make it out. And it just struck me how similar in its structural form uh, Iranian music is to Spanish music. Nobody would have thought that, but it is. The reason, of course, is that much of Spanish music uh, 
uh, was very much influenced by the period in which the, the uh, Umayyads created their dynasty in, uh, 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 in Spain. And that of course later the, the, the Berbers created their dynasties and so on in Spain. So much of that is still in that I can go on now, but the point nonetheless is we have been exchanging this music for a long time. The Ionian scale is the is Rab bin Awad, for example. And the Ionian scale is of course in Ionia, in Greece. And that's Rab bin Awad. The scales are pretty similar with the exception only of the blue scale, uh, which doesn't exist in the uh, Hindu Sutra and a couple of other scales. But nonetheless, most of the scales are pretty similar. The modes that we but the, I think the point, sorry, the point was not about just about scales, but the point that was important was that the way were transmitted from generation to generation through these ragas and through music. Music was the instrument through which Hinduism was transmitted not just horizontally, but from one generation to another. Without music, uh, the philosophy of Hinduism would not have survived. That is how central music is to the survival uh, and the growth and development and preaching of Hinduism. When the um, Arabs and later the Turks and Afghanis conquered parts of India, uh, they discovered that uh, uh, the, the, the popularity of the Hindu temple could not be matched. So they said, well, you know, you know what we should do? We should take these ragas and we should put Islamic themes uh, on the same ragas. And, uh, and through that we will be able to spread Islam. So they developed Sufi music. Sufi music is very much a hybrid mixture coming together of Persian literary traditions and musical traditions with Hindu uh, uh, musical and literary traditions. Even the language is completely mixed. There's no pure Urdu, there's no pure amongst the Sufis, there's no pure Urdu and there's no pure Hindi. They're using words from Persian, they're using words from Hindi, it's all over the place. They're using uh, musical movements from Hindustan and they are also using musical movements that you can clearly identify are either from Central Asia or from Persia. So all of that develops the tradition of Sufi music. And Sufi music is so popular in Pakistan that, uh, uh, but forget about Pakistan, it's so popular in India that when we release a Sufi song in Pakistan on YouTube, most of the hits on that YouTube video are from India. It's the truth. Okay? It, when in fact Pakistani artists know this so well, they're like, you know, I hope my video goes viral in India. Forget about Pakistan, I hope it goes viral in India. That's when it goes to India. It becomes big. And you can see now how Bollywood has taken up so many different themes, so many different songs and motifs of books from, and mostly plagiarized of course. Don't worry, we do it the other way around. We plagiarize Bollywood just as much as Bollywood plagiarizes us. But you can see how much of, uh, Nusrat Fateh Ali, for example, nearly every song of his that I can think of is, has been you know, used in some other song where somebody is dancing and looking really, really uh, sexy. Uh, uh, and when, when I hear the music though, the lyrics are changed around. When I hear the music though, I'm, I'm immediately reminded of what the original song is and I'm like, oh my god, this is just something so bizarrely kafka and different from its original, from where it originated from. But that's music, that's how it comes. But Islamic business, so this is Abid Abdul Hadi, considered to be the, a living legend in Pakistan. He is from Sin and is arguably the leading voice for Sufi music, uh, perhaps in all of South India. <coughs> Similarly, we have uh, the Enlightenment people, people who may not know, but Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven. Yeah. And Beethoven in particular was very much in favor of the French Revolution. Their music played a very central role in the new kingdom of the Imam. Now let's come to some modern stuff. The Woodstock concert of 1969 played a key role in developing the resistance to the Vietnam War. Uh, 
Uh, and it symbolizes uh, an the ideas of an entire generation that wanted to see a different kind of world. Of course, later on, all of it was uh, co-opted by big corporations and today that everything that was created in the late 1960s, almost all of that culture is now co-opted by large corporations. It was co-opted because it was, it was, the, the politics was taken out of it and the form of it was maintained. The hippie form was maintained and it was stripped of its radical political content and then that is how corporations would co-opt it and then resell it in a big Like for example, the Macintosh as a company, Apple as a company has really been, has really marketed itself as a company that supports the values of, Wo of Woodstock and of that 60s hippie generation. But the reality of course is that it does not. It tries to emulate the form of that cultural revolution. But it strips away its form. And this, is, this I think is very important for artists to realize. That if your art becomes disconnected to the politics, then it is nothing. It is not radical. If there is no politics behind it. Bob Dylan was radical only in so far as he was together with Joan Barr. And as soon as he went over to Christian fundamentalism, his radicalism was gone. He became a commercial artist. Joan Barr, of course, continues with radicalism. Bob Dylan. So the politics has always, it's always got to be central to that music. Otherwise, it's nothing for cooperation. It's not a threat to cooperation to just change the form of it, stay in a different scale, to wear different clothes. No big deal. You can wear whatever clothes. In fact, if I'm a capitalist, I'll make the clothes that you want to wear to be all kinds of things. I don't care about that. But don't be actually that. Don't join the Communist Party. Don't become a Marxist, Leninist. You know, don't go into those things. That is the noble thing. That's the thing. Just to play for you, uh, Jimi Hendrix's um, anthem, where, uh, which was against the Vietnam War. Okay, so we have to do this in a very scientific way because the audio is going to be played from there, the video is going to be played from there. So we're going to try to make sure that they're synced up exactly. So you see that what he's trying to do with the guitar is he's trying to make the sound from the guitar, from the electric guitar, he's trying to make the sounds of the Vietnam War in the middle of playing the national anthem. Of, of that country. So I'm trying to say to people that if this, I mean, we say that we are the land of freedom, but actually we become the land of indigenous. We become the land that's throwing bombs around the and making people and, and, and doing extremely horrible things. Here is my, uh, my great hero, uh, Bob Marley. Bob Marley is a very interesting figure. Because although he believed in a, in a religion which, were, which, which I don't believe in, the Rastafari religion, and most of his ideas really developed from that. This is black Zionism that he believed in. Uh, and they believed uh, that uh, Emperor Haile Selassie was uh, a divine figure and that everybody would return to Ethiopia, would return to Africa. That is why it's African Zionism. Um, so it's a very spiritual kind of religion, but you have to understand that in the context of the Caribbean, what it represented was a rebellion against the enslavement of black people and of all the people of the third world. And so African Zionism in the Caribbean represented sense of dignity for, for African people or people from African origins, that, they, that there was a part of Africa that was not colonized by Europe, by white people. So this is a very important concept that you take. Uh, these are uh, two very important politicians of Jamaica, Michael Manley, you can see, who is a left wing politician. And the left and the right were fighting it out in Jamaica. And uh, 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 there were street battles going on in the French town, etc. And they were getting really, really vicious in violence. And so Bob Marley did this very important concert called the One Love Peace Concert, where he actually managed to get both politicians to come and join hands and say, we're going to, you know, fight, you know, we're going to, sorry, we're going to, do the, we're going to continue to argue with, with respect to politics, but they're killing 
the mayhem has to stop. Um, so that was the power of Bob Marley that he could bring even opposite politicians together. Uh, the other major concept he did, which was incredible work, was the independence concept he did for Zimbabwe. And he has a number of songs about, uh, uh, you know, in Zimbabwe we become independent, etc. And of course, the Zimbabwe independence was led by Robert Mugabe, who later on has been vilified in the Western press like nobody else. Uh, but Robert Mugabe in the 70s and 80s was, a, was like Nelson Mandela, a great figure in, in, in the African liberation movement. So we're going to, I want to play this particular concept here. You may or may not agree that these politicians need to come together. You may say, Michael Mandy ought to destroy the other side, etc. And I agree with that. I generally tend to be of that view. But I'm demonstrating to you the power that, that Bob Marley had as a musician uh, over society. One, two, three. <laughs> He has been a prisoner locked up for 25 years in a South African prison. He languishes there for his belief that his people should be free. The man is Nelson Mandela. Arabic. Sorry if I pronounced that badly. 
Taura. Is that better? Okay. Taura. Uh, which means revolution. But if you notice the slogan, it's, it's music. It's just music. Listen to it. Ready? Dedicated to Bhagat Singh. 
with that year. Um, you know, it, it is the, the most closely associated with the But he, of course, deliberately quoted death to make, it, to make the point that uh, we are not afraid of British colonialism and that we are consciously ready to lay down our lives for the cause of freedom. The, the boy over here, uh, or the guy over here, the man over here, is Heather Lipat, who uh, is also a radical uh, activist, and he's saying, Jab laal laal lehrae ka, tab ghosh thikhane ka. That means, when the red flag, when you see the red flag waving, uh, then only will you come to your bloody senses. Idiot. <laughs> but that part I am. <laughs> so uh, then only will you come to your senses. And then he's saying, Surkoga, Surkoga, Asia Surkoga, which means Asia will be, will be red, which means Asia will be socialist.
Here is uh, India now. Uh, is, uh, I think Indian companies might be able to recognize that this is IIT in Kanpur. Uh, and this is a point that was being read out in India of a Pakistani communist poet, Kaisan Mutayas. And then the Hindu people were very, very upset. So first I'll play the video and then I'll tell you what happened after this. Oh, sorry. On December 17, students of IIT Kanpur had staged a protest against the Citizenship Amendment Act. The students recited Pakistani poet Faiz Ahmed Faiz's poem Hum Dekhenge as a mark of protest. So, uh, Atul will be able to tell you more. Atul, you want to say a few words about it? It's just that uh, somebody, uh, Indian government last year, last year, last year, last year uh, they said uh, that uh, uh, no one can actually uh, sing this song. This is a protest song, Sentry by Faiz and very popular, uh, sung by Mohammed uh, Bhan Manu. Uh, very popular song, we sing it in a protest uh, in a different country. And the Indian government no acting as well, you cannot say. So this is when the comments, uh, I would say, of the left, and not only say the political left, or the students of the left political party, or the activists, or the left party as such, was singing. IIT Kanpur, I don't know which IIT, there are so many IIT, but IIT Kanpur, the students, they are not actually organized. Let me be very frank with you. So they are the common people who are saying no problem, we are still saying, we will defy you. And that, this is one cultural aspect uh, which you can see that Indian students are defying the state and saying we will say, this is the solidarity, this is the revolutionary song. And this doesn't belong to Pakistan, to just Pakistan. It belongs to everyone. So this is how it is. This is the story. Uh, yes. And there are many more examples, but I won't like to interrupt here right now in Javis class. But we can talk about it later. For example, you must have heard about Tazadi and everything. So yes, but whatever he has said is very important. So this is one aspect. We can talk about it later. So what? Thank you. The interesting thing is not that somebody disrupted uh, this particular meeting where someone was reciting affairs and affairs. Um, and interestingly, the point at which he interrupts the point is the point at which the poet is referring to Mansoor Haraj, who was a Sufi who was killed by the Khalifa of Islam, brutally murdered by the Khalifa of Islam, executed, I should say, by the Khalifa of Islam for rebelling. And Mansoor Haraj is considered like a kind of Sufi communist in the Muslim tradition. That's what Kaiz is referring to. But anyway, the interesting thing here is not that this was disrupted, but what happened after this. And when this clip went viral and it went on the media, the people in India, students who were not necessarily associated with the left, said to help with this. And we are the singing, so they started making videos of the, on their phone of themselves singing Ham Dekhinge, the song by Iqbal Banu, who's over here. They started singing it and they started sharing it, openly defying the BJP government's attempt to ban the singing of this song. That was quite remarkable. That brings me to a close. I didn't, don't necessarily want to end this presentation by saying, look, the Indians are copying us. I say, I'm like, okay. <laughs> we are also copying them. Uh, and, uh, uh, what second, uh, that was a joke and I tried to clarify that that was a joke otherwise. Uh, <laughs> misunderstanding might occur. North India, in particular, shares a common history and heritage going back thousands of years. Civilizationally, linguistically, there is hardly any difference between us. I can communicate with my North Indian comrades here without any difficulty. South Indian comrades I can communicate with in English or if they have picked up Hindi or North Indian languages, etc. But Given this, uh, uh, what call, the, given the fact that we are really one common civilization, though we are not one nation, we are certainly not one state, we are many nations, and we are two, at least two states, but we are one common civilization. That can be 
judged by the fact that we have at least a thousand years of shared culture, language, poetry, and history. And so that for that that is why we sing their poetry. For example, the song that the Pakistani girl Aruj Aurangzeb was the poetry that the Pakistani girl Aruj Aurangzeb was singing was from India, and the song that the Indians were singing was from Pakistan. And that's Rohingya internationalism in the sphere of culture. That's what we want to build, and building that, we will build also a new world.